welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Stephen Hansen, Associate Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simone Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Osden, Washington Editor. Karen Koch tesman Senior Editor. On this week's podcast, we'll discuss the key takeaways from two exclusive Q&As with sector veterans. Steve's conversation with Acting FDA Commissioner Janet Woodcock, and then Simone's chat with flagship pioneering's founder and CEO, Nubar Afayan. Plus, we'll get Karen's take on how GenMab is approaching deal-making. Steve, you covered a lot of ground in your Q&A with Janet Woodcock. So what were some of the highlights? I think the most newsworthy thing were her comments about aducanumab. She said that she supported the accelerated approval of aducanumab. She said it was consistent with accelerated approvals for cancer drugs and that the evidence supporting it was, quote, solid. She also said the justification for that approval will be provided in the review documents that will be released soon. I think that's going to be really important and really interesting to see if FDA actually justifies why it's all in on the amyloid hypothesis. The other thing that Dr. Woodcock said was that she wasn't personally involved in making the decision. I think that's important. And I also think it's entirely consistent with what four other FDA commissioners have told me. FDA commissioners simply don't review drugs. And I think that a lot of people have a misunderstanding about that. It would have been extraordinarily difficult for Janet Woodcock to have overturned the decision if it had been made at a lower level. So in a sense, people who read into this a lot, and this is also what Dr. Woodcock said, people who read into this accelerated approval a great deal and say that it says a lot about the direction that FDA is going in, the level of evidence that it's going to require for other drugs, even for other drugs for, for Alzheimer's, but certainly across the board are exaggerating its significance. And, and I think as we've talked about in this podcast before, FDA is really siloed. What happens in the Office of Neuroscience, for example, has very little carryover to what happens in oncology or other areas. Steve, that of course is true, but there is also this issue of ADCOMs, the advisory committees, and you know we saw three members of this one resign. I don't know if Dr. Woodcock talked to you about that at all. She, she didn't, but very interestingly, early last week, there was a bio conversation, a conversation at the bio digital meeting that Richard Pops, the CEO of Alkermes, did with Patricia Cavazzoni, the director of CEDAR, and Peter Marks, the director of CBER. And Richard Pops said, adcoms are FUBAR, aren't they? And very interestingly, Patricia Cavazzoni basically said, yeah, they're FUBAR. And then she said, you know, I'm going to take some heat for this. But Cavazzoni said, one of the things that she thinks is messed up about advisory committees is that they're overly emotional, that patients come and testify and that committee members then make decisions based on their emotions rather than the scientific data. As you said, there have been examples at recent advisory committee meetings, and I think she meant the PD-1 meetings about accelerated approval, where advisory committee members had voted contrary to the facts that were in front of them and based on their emotions. Peter Marks didn't go so far, but he also did say that he thinks that there are problems with advisory committees. Patricia Cavazzoni said that CEDARS got an initiative underway to think about ways to improve adcoms. BIO's also got an initiative underway where they're going to be thinking about how to improve adcoms. And I think that's something that does cut across the agency. Do you think it's a lot of hot air? Do you think we might actually see change? I certainly hope we will. I think it might not be as obvious as people think it might be. Because if you think about it, the whole reason to have an advisory committee is to provide scientific advice to FDA. And I think that they've become something else. They've become a public spectacle. They've become a mock trial where people focus on the votes. They don't focus on the discussion. There's very little informed discussion at most of the advisory committee meetings. And there's just a binary vote up or down. You have situations where you have people who are experts, for example, in biostatistics, who are asked to make an up or down vote on whether a drug is safe and effective for a certain condition when they're not really medical experts. So I think that the direction that it will go in, I think the direction it it is going in and should go in, is to put much less attention on the advisory committees, which come at the end of a process, after a company may have spent a billion dollars on drug development and the drug may have been under development for a decade or more, I think that the focus is going to be and should be much earlier in the process and finding ways for FDA to receive public and especially scientific input earlier in the process. 
if you take the example of aducanumab, I think that what should have happened after the first advisory committee, and actually much earlier in the process, FDA should have had a public meeting with scientific experts, not to discuss whether it should approve aducanumab, but to discuss whether the amyloid hypothesis is well enough validated so that it should become the basis for approving drugs for Alzheimer's. If you'd had that public meeting and there'd been a scientific consensus on this before aducanumab came up for approval, the decision would have been much easier for FDA and it would have been much less contentious. I think well, the problem just, for, for I, Biogen and FDA might have been that it might have been a much easier decision because the scientific community might have said, you know what, this isn't a validated endpoint and you shouldn't use it to approve drugs. Yeah, I, I've got to say on that one, I do agree with you in principle, but in practice, getting any consensus around the amyloid hypothesis, I think that would have been a tall order. But I think it will be really important to see how they address this. Pazda himself drew analogies between this surrogate endpoint, the general problems of surrogate endpoints, what goes on in cancer. Maybe this has lit a fire under the whole issue, both of adcoms and of how they use surrogate endpoints in their approvals. Certainly, the patient groups are going to have something to say about the idea that it's overly emotional and how important their weight is, because they fought for a long time to be part of the process and to be listened to. And so they're not obviously going to want to give ground there. So finding a way still to capture the patient voice is going to be really tricky. You mentioned Pastor. Of course, that's Dr. Richard Pastor, director of FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence. I think that if you had a scientific meeting and you couldn't come to a consensus about the amyloid hypothesis, that suggests to me that you shouldn't approve a drug based on it that's going to be potentially given to millions of people. A surrogate endpoint should be, there should be enough strength of the data behind it before a drug is approved on that basis. I agree with you that the patient groups and patient advocates need to have a voice at advisory committees. They need to have a voice throughout the approval process, but there also has to be a recognition that, for example, the patients who were harmed or the patients who didn't feel like they received any benefit from aducanumab or the patients who received placebo and believed that they had benefited from aducanumab, they weren't at that advisory committee. So there has to be an understanding that the testimony from patients is highly selective. It's very important, but it's not necessarily representative of all of patient experience. I think there also has to be a recognition that some of the patient groups are aligned with the interests of the manufacturers. Some of the patient groups accept funding from the manufacturers. Some of them provide grants and facilitate drug development. And I think that's a very good thing when it happens, but it also has to be understood that's where they're coming from when they're making their statements at advisory committee meetings. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the advisory committee is part of it's also about transparency, right? So you have to maintain that to some degree somewhere. You don't want to be doing away with that aspect either. Moving on to Simone, in your conversation that you had with Nubar, who is really one of those figures in the sector that you don't even really need a surname for Nubar. He's, you can just say like Nubar said, you can just say Nubar said, and everyone knows what you're talking about. Uh, on that point, what were some of the really interesting points that he made in your discussion? Yeah, Nubar Madonna. He is always an incredibly interesting person to talk to. I'll tell you that what I published was probably about 30% of the interesting stuff. It's not true. I managed to distill it down. But there were a few extra points that unfortunately got on the cutting room floor that we can get to. But the two things I want to focus on. Nubar is obviously CEO of Flagship Pioneering, founder and CEO. Flagship is behind the mRNA technology. It's behind Moderna and several other areas that were very innovative, very cutting edge when Flagship backed them. Nubar talks a fair amount about that, that no one thought it could possibly be worth eight, you know, $2 billion. It's now got a market cap of just north of $80 billion. Flagship had just announced an expanded fund, their Fund 7, which now has $3.4 billion. That is a lot of money. And so I did pose to him the question about how, what he feels about concerns that there's too much money in the ecosystem, that there just isn't going to be enough money around to create a proper ROI on, on all the investments. And what he said is he said that really is a concern if you are chasing what he calls 
here and now value pools. And he didn't say this, but he's referring to things like everyone going after CARTs or piling into the areas which are well-established technologies. And he says there is a finite pool and it's growing fast. And so that is a concern. And he said there is an opportunity in new technologies where, shall I say it, they've planted their flag, such as mRNA, microbiome, red blood cells, technologies with Rubius, microbiome series was one of the first ones. Some of those have yet to prove themselves, but he says that these are value pools that are going to be available in five to 10 years, and it is up to them, to flagships, portfolio companies, to create those value pools, and if they do, they'll be rewarded, and if they don't, they won't. So he's never afraid of condemning others in the industry, and he was quite critical of people, I felt, who are going off the same, what he calls, value pools. The image I have of that is kindergartners playing soccer, where they all go with the ball instead of spreading out. One of the things that he said that was I just interesting... wonder if our listeners know how big a deal it is that Steve brought in a sporting analogy to uh, explain this. I have watched kindergartners play soccer. I've even played with them. The other thing that he said that was interesting, and I actually had read your interview when I interviewed Dr. Woodcock, so I asked her about the same thing, was that... He made a a distinction between drugs that are developed based on a deep knowledge of the mechanisms, mechanistic-based drug development, and what he called a shots-on-goal approach. And I asked Dr. Woodcock about that, and she said that drug development now is in a a mixed mode where there are some companies and some areas where there's enough knowledge about them that there can be this mechanistic-based drug development and that they can move very quickly. She also said that for the areas where there is this knowledge of the underlying mechanisms and the technologies are very new, that it's very important for drug developers and FDA to collaborate together closely. And she gave the example of gene therapy and said that it's really not going to be possible to make progress without that kind of strong collaboration between regulators and um, Uh, drug developers. Actually, it's interesting because Nubar mostly agrees with that. And what he says is that there's this wholesale, he calls it a shots on goal approach, he calls it a probabilistic approach. And it's built on the idea that you hear all the time in biotech that nothing works, you've got very low probability of success. So you have to spend a huge amount of money on drug development, it all trickles through to drug pricing and access even. And he says, everybody's got this attitude of this can't work. What if you went to work every day, he says, and were like a shoe manufacturer making Fitbits and you just assumed what you were making was going to work? What he says, similar to what Dr. Woodcock says, is that we've actually come a long way and there are a lot of technologies out there that mean we can do this a lot smarter and it doesn't have to be a shots on goal approach. He says, in fact, that it's he believes that drug developers are almost the last one to get the message that they are still stuck in a mindset of low probability in the way they go about things. Whereas actually there are a lot more technologies now that enable a more directed and what he calls deterministic approach. I want to spend one more minute on his sort of grand idea, which is he uses the word health security. Uh, It's a bit like J&J's interception, and he credits J&J with coming to him with that concept. It is a little bit buzzwordy, but actually what he means is a sense of security, not national security, but health maintenance as a form of security, and that we should be spending money on that. The UK has done a study that shows about 3% of money is spent on what he calls a pre-disease state and 97% on an after-disease state. And, you know, it's not a new idea that preventing disease, obviously, is a lot more cost effective. It is the case that the biopharma industry doesn't spend a huge amount of time or money on stopping disease before it gets there. He calls vaccines exhibit A, B, C and D. And what he wants to do is use machine learning, AI, and use that to create I suppose, detection systems, but also interventions, let's say, that can capture people in the pre-disease state, like pre-diabetes, and use those technologies to find which sectors of the population require which treatments. And Velo Health is an example of company that they founded. And Karen, you wrote about them actually a short while ago. Yeah, talking to them is really interesting because they seem to be going in on this idea of 
using computation and machine learning across the whole spectrum of drug development from the target discovery to patient monitoring in your trials and back again and the compound development as well. So this idea of an in silico kind of conveyor belt across the whole thing. And one of the things that I think that relies on is having a deep well of data that's informative. And with Velo, they talked about, they've got some disclosed partnerships and I think some undisclosed ones with organizations that have sort of longitudinal data on on certain patient types going a long way or deep phenotyping within a certain disease area. And the question is, you know, will that type of data become available more broadly beyond a handful of companies like Velo who form these kinds of partnerships so that the whole drug development ecosystem can work in that way? Another thing that's interesting, I spoke with Stephen Hahn, who Nubar's hired to be the CMO of this initiative. And it's really an interesting and honestly, a controversial appointment. Obviously, there's a lot of mixed feelings about Stephen Hahn's performance as FDA commissioner. When I spoke with him about it, he was more interested in talking about his experience at MD Anderson and its relevance to this than his experience at FDA. So I actually did ask Nubar because he's hired also Chris Austin, who was uh, at NIH, of course, at NCATS, and Aradazi, who is actually a lord, but also a former minister in the UK's government. And I asked him if there's a thread here of government appointees joining flagship. And he said, I wouldn't look for a trend there. He said that he's mostly interested in what these folks have done in their medical and scientific careers before then. One thing I want to add, going back to something Karen said, because I posed to Nuba this question about how much does he worry about interoperability, about the data quality and large sort of system-wide issues, plus privacy. What he said is those are really important challenges to solve across the system, by which I mean the ecosystem, but he can't wait for that. And waiting to solve all of those problems is not the right order to do it in. He feels that Velo has collected, and Karen, I think you referred to this, they've collected a certain amount of data. So they've created their own system of data, which they've obtained from various sources. They need to ensure that is valid and so on and work within that. But one company like Flagship can make inroads, but it's not his goal to solve machine learning, data science, system-wide. That that actually fits in interestingly with something else that Dr. Woodcock said, which he's been saying for some time. When you mentioned that a lot of biopharma companies are assuming that most of the things that they're going to do won't work, and that this is in contrast with other sectors. The other thing that she said is that most sectors that are successful in the world now have a model that's based on continuous improvement. And healthcare doesn't, and it should. And the collection of real world data, the improvement of the way that electronic health records are assembled, collated, and made available, learning more about the performance of drugs in the real world, those are things that are gonna be really important to creating a learning healthcare system and the ability to have continuous improvement, not only in drug development, but and what's more important in the, in the healthcare system overall that the drugs are used in. Interesting. Those are some very interesting sort of takeaways from two pretty fascinating conversations. I wanted to move on finally to chat with Karen a little bit about the story that she did last week in which basically she was talking to GenMab, a company that in the past decade, they've really been one of these examples of a biotech that has been building tremendous value through partnering sort of first out licensing their own assets like uh, Darzalex, Daratumumab. And now as nearly a $30 billion company themselves, and now they're looking to bring in new innovation from external partners. So Karen, what's the strategy and what does it really mean for small biotechs here going forward? Well, it's interesting. So we noticed GenMab was doing some interesting deals combining their biologics technology, in particular their duo body by specifics platform with other modality technologies out there, including things like mRNA for mRNA encoded antibodies. And that was a partnership with CureVac for a while back, or the latest was with Bolt for their immune stimulating antibody conjugates. It's like an ADC, uh, but instead of a cytotoxic payload, it's a TLR78 activator to get the myeloid cells 
going in tumors. And so, you know, sat down with Jan and asked, what's the trend here and what are you looking for? And wrote the story from the perspective of if you're a small biotech looking to partner with GenMab, what are they doing and what are they after? It was interesting to see, you know, looking at the deals, they tend to do these small upfronts and GenMab's definitely prioritizing commercialization rights. Like you mentioned, Stephen, that kind of turnaround from partnering out and having uh, the, the larger partners do the commercialization to taking on at least 50-50 of those rights or more. But there tended to be at least a, a slice of commercialization open to their partners. And then in terms of things that they're looking at, it seems they're looking at the immune cell engager space, but like some of the things we've been seeing, going beyond just the CD3 engagers to recruiting other types of T cells or NK cells. And we've seen investment going in that space. They're also interested in different types of payloads for ADCs that you could potentially even mix and match on the same antibody or the, the same biologic structure. They're also looking at what are some delivery technologies to get uh, sort of more potent administration to enable subcutaneous delivery or potentially even reaching that oral delivery approach that it, it's pretty challenging, but, you know, or things that can get you your biologic in the right place of the body at the right time. Those are some of the things they're looking out for. But in general, the message was really clear that they're done with quote unquote naked antibodies. He says that's just a commodity now. And so looking at modalities that show a really differentiated effect in preclinical studies, a 10 or 100 fold difference, he said, above the gold standard, and looking to combining modalities as a way to get even further away from that naked antibody. Karen, is GenMab sticking to their knitting of, well, you say lots of different modalities, and it's still largely based around biologics, correct? Still around antibodies. They're not looking to splash out into other areas like cell therapy or anything like that. They're still sticking to the to largely antibody-based approach. Yeah, it was around how do you bring in aspects of different modalities to enhance what you can do with biologics, with their duo bodies or their hexabodies, et cetera. So what kind of payloads can you stick on there with differentiating effects? Can you encode it in a, a nucleic acid and deliver it that way, which he says could really enable combinations of biologics that more resemble polyclonal immune response, which is harder to do when you're delivering a bunch of protein antibodies. It really does revolve at the end around the biologics approach, but mixing and matching with other modalities to get stronger and, and better effects. Simone, did Nubar have any thoughts on whether these mRNA encoded antibodies or mRNA therapeutics are the real deal? He answered quite strongly when I even intimated that there are people who argue that mRNA is only proven as a vaccine so far and not as a therapeutic modality. He said that is a snobbish <laughs> attitude. <laughs> he says it's been in millions and millions of people worldwide and that sure the dosing will need to be adjusted and you may have to demonstrate still safety but the, the concept he says is absolutely the same. It will work as a therapeutic as it does as a vaccine and he rejects the idea that there is a difference really um, between the two. So he is yes adamant and argues completely mRNA is a proven technology, full stop, or period, as you say over here. Interesting. Finally, we have this week's Deal in Focus, where last week, Bristol-Myers Squibb was the latest to bring in an ADC in a high-value deal when it partnered with ESI to jointly develop and commercialize antifolate receptor ADC, Morab202. It marks BMS's first foray into ADCs in solid tumors, and it didn't come cheap. The pharma paid $650 million up front and up to $2.5 billion in milestones for the Phase 1-2 program. According to BioCentury's Lauren March, the deal gives a fits BMS's early pipeline strategy focused on broad mechanistic diversity. That's all that we have time for for this week's podcast. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. <laughs>